Good morning. morning. Welcome to Grace Point. Welcome to those of you joining us online. Also, I'd encourage you, if you're at home, you might want to grab some communion elements here at some point in the service, because we're going to do communion at the end of the the morning. Um, So we're going to begin today uh, a series from the book of Daniel that'll last 10 weeks and cover chapters 1 through uh, 6. Daniel is an example of living holy in a fractured world. And so we're going to use him as our supreme example of all the stuff we've been looking at thus far in the year 2023. Our theme for the year 2023 is is how do we as Christ followers do well in in a a broken, fractured world. And Daniel is a a great example uh, to model our lives after. Um, Romans 8, verses 37 through 39 tell us this. In all these things, we are more than a conqueror, through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this promise in the New Testament is really illustrated by Daniel in the Old Testament. And what I, what I want to encourage you uh, to have is this kind of a mindset today. No matter what you're going through in your life, no matter what, what's going on and the circumstances that you're facing and maybe the trials that you're facing, maybe the, maybe the big things uh, that you're facing, remember, God's a conqueror in you. He, he, he can, he's sufficient. And he can do more than you can emo- uh, imagine or hope for. And we are supposed to be like Daniel in the midst of the most adverse trying circumstances, we are called to live a holy life, a life set apart for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, Daniel's story is like so many stories of the Bible. It begins with an ending. And if you kind of think this way, you'll begin to see some of the Bible a little bit differently. Really, Noah's story is about an ending and then a beginning, right? It's the end of the world and the beginning of a new uh, era uh, with Noah and, and family. We're told that at the end of the age that the old world and the old heaven will be put away and God will put on a new heaven and a new earth. That's what God does. He, he takes us to an ending only to begin something new. Think about when you're born again in Jesus Christ. What happens? Your old life what? It washes away. It ends. It ends. It's done. You come to an ending and God begins something new in you, new and, and exciting. The Old Testament says the path of the just shines more and more unto the perfect day. God's about doing new things in us that gets more and more and more. The Apostle Paul said we're being changed by the Spirit of God from one degree of glory to another degree of glory. There's always this new thing that God is up to in life. So whatever you're facing today, whatever's going on, just remember this. God's a God who brings some things to an end, but he always begins something new. It's, it's just, he's a God of new beginnings. And so we're going to begin now in our Daniel series by looking at Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And we're going to see here in this scripture that something comes to an end here in these young Hebrew men's life, but God's up to beginning something new too. So, so just kind of have that perspective as I read the scripture. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Asphanas, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome showing aptitude of every, for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. That's where we're going to end our Daniel reading for today. What we see here right away in the book of Daniel is an ending. But it's not an ending in that it's a launch into a new beginning, too. 
And so with that in mind, let's talk about the ending for a moment. The nation of Israel was defeated. They were done. They were no more. Despite decades of warnings from prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and other faithful prophets, God delivered Jehoiakim and the remnant of, the, uh, of Judah, uh, all that remained of the people, into the hands of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. I just finished uh, listening in my Bible to the book of Isaiah. Now I'm into the book of, of Jeremiah. And you know what? There is a lot of redundancy of warning here to these people. You know, follow my ways, God says. Adhere to my ways. Repent, return to me, or I'm gonna, you're going to be no more. And we finally see that it's the end. God says, okay, we're done. You know, you've, you've been people who have, have modeled flagrant apostasy before me, and there's been immorality that's, that's unheard of, and there's this continual mockery of the messengers that I send to you, and you're constantly ignoring my words? Okay. And he gave them into the hands of the Babylonians. Now, here's what I find really interesting. Uh, I want to just step out of the story for a moment. You, you need to do that with me. Um, I want you to think about this. Think about how God delivered Israel from Egypt. He delivered them with signs and wonders, and he showed that he was the one true God in that delivery of, of Israel from Egypt. Well, just like God showed himself to be strong in that situation, even though it appears here that, that there's utter defeat of Israel. God's not defeated. And in this defeat of, of little Judah and Jehoiakim and gang, we're going to see that God will once again, like he did in the delivery of Israel from Egypt, he is going to show himself to be the one true God. In the midst of all that, all this tragedy and all this turmoil, God's going to show himself to be mighty and the only true God. God. So he's doing a new work of revelation. Once again here, even in the ending of something, God is still at work and beginning something new. And, and, and it's an opportunity for those who were taken captive by the Babylonians to have a new beginning, a new dependency on God. We often don't see life this way, do we? We often just see what we lost, as evidenced by the recent pandemic. All people could see was what they lost. They couldn't see what God was doing. They couldn't embrace the new day of opportunity of dependence on God. All we could do was look at all the things and lament everything we thought we had lost. And we as Christ followers, we should have in that moment understood, God, you're up to something great. You're purifying. You're doing a work in us of separating us from the world so that we could be more dependent upon you. See, that's our God. He brings something to an end only to start something new again in our lives, if we're willing and open to his moving. Here's point number two. Daniel was part of the first deportation, too. He got to experience that. <laughs> the ancient Babylonians used a technique to subdue and uh, utilize their enemies. They would relocate them. They would relocate them. The goal was to take the best of the best from their enemies and assimilate them into Babylonian culture so that they'd cease to be who they were and they'd become part of the new collective. That's, that's how they worked. They just, they were going to reorient it. And part of the way was just get you out of anything familiar, get you into everything new, disorient you to 100% and, and re, re, um, redoctrinate you into, into the Babylonian culture. And there are four tests that, that these young men are facing that I just read about here in the scripture that I shared with you today that we're going to talk about. There are four tests that these young men had to face as their lives came to an end as they knew it and God was going to begin something new in their lives. And we face these same tests in our culture today. And if we don't know how to address these tests and how to stand fast in our God, then we're not going to do and be the people that God wants us to be. Amen? We're not going to do what he wants us to do, and we're not going to be who he wants us to be. And God's always up to something new. Amen? Amen. And we've got to quit looking at the endings and thinking it's the end. As the people of God, we've got to understand God's always moving us from point A to point B. He's always growing us in our faith. He's always bringing us from glory uh, uh, to, uh, to glory, and he's always beginning something new. So we're going to talk on these four tests of faith today. That's all I have time to share with you today. We'll, we'll, we'll expand more on this over the next few weeks.
But today I just want to identify these for you and kind of tickle you a little bit of, of what the series is going to be like. All right. So here's the four tests of faith. Test number one that these young men face that I think all of us face as Christ followers when something comes to an end in our life and God begins something new. And this is isolation. Isolation. In verses 3 and 4, we're told the king ordered Asphanas, chief of his court officials, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. And he was to bring them out of their culture, out of everything that they knew, and he was to relocate them into this new place, and he was supposed to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. In other words, you're supposed to retrain these people to think differently. So the first faith test that we see here in the case of these young Hebrew men is simply this, the test of isolation. The test of isolation. Now, I want you to think about this with me for a moment. I want you to think about this, all right, with me. How do you act or talk when you're the only Christian around? I want you to personalize this. How do you act or think when you're the only Christian around? When you're the only Christian in your workplace? When you're the only Christian in your biological family, perhaps. Perhaps for some of you students, you're going home, you've had this wonderful year at Grace Point, and you've grown in Jesus Christ, but you go home to a situation that's not as friendly as here. How do you act when you're the only one that's the Christ follower? How, uh, how, do, you, how do you act when nobody really knows or cares that you're a Christ follower? They don't give you a hoot. And when you're being marginalized, like our culture is doing right now, to anybody of the Christian who's truly, authentically, evangelically Christian, you're being marginalized like crazy. You understand that, right? See, you look around here. This is abnormal. Do you understand that? Most of the Christian movement now in our country is ceasing to be, is quickly going to the wayside. We have something special going on here, and I don't know what's going on. I praise God for it. But most people are facing this thing of isolation in, in a real way. They're feeling totally cut off, unsupported. Isolation is a major test of faith. Because when you're, the, you're, you're thinking you're the only one, there's this frailty uh, of humanity. There's this, this uh, what I would call, um, you know, fallen nature kind of tendency to try to fit in. And just to make the best of the thing. And not to, not to, not to you know, shake things up too much, but to blend in. These, yeah, these Hebrew boys were taken away from everything that was sacred. Think about what they, they experienced. No more temple worship. They didn't have that, that, that routine of support. It's gone. No more priestly offering of, of sacrifices for their sins. What they knew was gone. What they were familiar was gone. The ritual, the tradition, it's all gone. They don't have that support system anymore. Uh, their parents, probably no more. No support system there at all. They're young men. They're, they're young teenagers, most likely. And they've they're just been ripped out of their family. And they're taken away in isolation to, to Babylon. It's possible for you to be the only true Christian in your school today, in your classroom today. That's possible to have happen. I remember going to high school, and I remember being in the Bedrick's class. It was English lit class, and we actually studied the book of Job. <laughs> yeah. And I realized very quickly in this class that I was one of maybe two Christians in that whole class of 35 students. And he kept calling on me because he knew it. He'd say, Norby, defend Job here. What do you do when you're the only one and you feel really isolated? Where do you turn? Do you ever have that experience? You know what? I'm going to tell you this. Isolation is the fertile ground for a greater dependence on Jesus Christ. It can turn us from the the trappings of this world. It can turn us from dependency on those things that should not be dependent upon. And it can turn our hearts to dependence on Jesus Christ alone. But we have to let it do that. We have to turn that direction. That's what these Hebrew boys did. They turned to greater dependence on God than ever because of their isolation from their former ways and their former nation. And I want to tell you, Christ followers, in this time... An age, we're going to be isolated more and more as followers of Christ, and we have to depend on him more than ever. Amen? Amen. All right, let's go to faith test number two, indoctrination. In verse four, we're told that, that he was to teach the Hebrews the language and literature of the Babylonians. In other words, these Hebrews were to be indoctrinated into the ways of Babylon. Now, 
you have to live in the sand or something, head in the sand, if you don't see the indoctrinational efforts of culture right now. It's everywhere, right? You turn on the TV, indoctrination. It's so indoctrinated. It's not even hidden anymore. You can't turn it on without being bombarded with things that are anti-Christ and anti-Bible. And you just, it's just, they're trying to normalize it all. And it just, it might not even be part of the storyline, but it's there. It's constantly there. Social media, it's constantly there. You talk about the government. I don't even know what the government's doing anymore. I don't even know. They're confused. <laughs> And I'm confused along with them. How about you? I don't have any idea what they even think. And then you, think, you look at the educational systems and, oh my goodness, they can be very, very indoctrinational. can be very indoctrinational. For these Hebrew boys, they were being taught how to be magicians and enchanters now. And the goal was to turn them into Chaldeans and to turn them away from being Israelites. There was a very purposeful indoctrinational effort being made to change who they are and their basic belief system. We need to be aware of indoctrination and its, its efforts uh, uh, and what it's trying to really do. It's a test of faith. And, and it, it, it's so prevalent in our culture. And you know what? Our response need to be, needs to be wholehearted devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ without any apology, without even being ashamed. We need to be wholeheartedly following Jesus Christ, and we need to be ones that are adhering to the revealed truth of the Bible. The Bible says there's a way that seems right, but in the end it leads to death. And there's ways that seem right to those who are far from God, but in the end it leads to death. It leads to destruction. It leads to depression. It leads to despair. You know, and oftentimes it takes a decade or two for the consequences to catch up with the actions. And that's the hard part for us Christ followers. We're in that in-between time frequently saying, no, 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 no. And it's just going to take a couple, couple decades for it all to come to light. This was terrible. This was a terrible move or whatever. But in the meantime, what we have to do is we have to stand fast in our, in our Savior. We are in a culture that's becoming radically indoctrinational in this approach with a bunch of radical behaviors. And what we need to do in response is be radically devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We just have to be. One little book that I've read, and over my life now, I've read a lot of Christian books. And uh, I just finished one that uh, was about the unhurried life that's really good. But at any rate, I, 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 this little book I read years ago um, really changed how I, I viewed my Christianity. Because I came to Christ as kind of a wild man. Anybody relate to me on that? I didn't come to, I'm not a church boy. <laughs> I grew up in Brooklyn Park. We went to church every now and then. We weren't a church family. I didn't have those moorings. I would swear with the best of them or the worst of them, whichever way you want to look at that. I was a bit of a hellion. I did some things that, you know, I look back and this. If you knew me as a teenager and you see me now, you'd say, what? In fact, my family thinks of me that way still. I remember going to a family gathering and they just said, you're a pastor of a big church. It's like they just finally figured this out. And I remember both, a couple of my aunts just staring at me like, really, you are? You ever had that stare down? And I'm going... Yeah, you know, that was like 50 years ago, but yeah, you know, that's my hall of shame. I'm not proud of what I did, you know, but that's what they think of me as, right? And, 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 and but, but at any rate, um, so I'm reading these books. And by the way, anybody else a book reader in here beside me? You love to read books? I want to give you permission. A lot of the books you read aren't worth reading. You'll get like a chapter two in, but then if you're, you're like me, you think, I paid for the book or whatever, I need to finish it. No, you don't. Quit. Throw the book away. Stop. I give you permission, okay? Some of you need that permission. I've been giving myself permission lately. Oh, this book is, all right, first chapter, they're done. The rest is just filler. All right, I'm done. I don't need to read the rest of this book, right? Just throw the book aside. You know, you're not getting graded on it, most of you, right? <laughs> If at this point, so I, I, I read this little book here years ago. It, was, uh, it brought me back to my, my, my beginning point of being a radical follower of Jesus, uh, which I think I've been pretty much my whole life. But at any rate, it's called The Barbarian Way by Erwin McManus. The Barbarian Way by Erwin McManus. How to, uh, how to escape from civilized Christianity. This is like the tag. 
And I read this book and I remembered my beginning as I read that book and how radically Jesus changed my life and, and how much, and I, I, I read that book. I said, okay, God, you're granting me permission once again to be a barbarian, so to speak. I don't have to be a tamed Christian. I don't have to be civilized. I have to love Christ with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I have to just be crazy in love with him. I tell you what, in a world that is so indoctrinational, what it needs is a counterpart that's just as radically, as radically committed. Amen? How many of you remember President Reagan? Did, you, did any of you live during that time? Raise your hand. I want people to see that I'm not the only old one in here. So what, President Reagan was one of my favorite presidents, but here's, here's why. You remember he was called the Teflon Man? Anybody remember that language? Anybody? Teflon Man? He, he, he kind of came out of the, the media, and he was really good at handling media. And when they would try to catch him up on stuff, he would just turn it back on them. It was fun to watch him stump the media and, and just call them out and say, I'm not going to answer that stupid question with the agenda behind it. He, you remember him saying stuff like that? He was so forthright. I mean, I loved him as a politician, and, and he was called the Teflon Man. Nothing that they threw at him would stick. They could never get anything to stick. He just wouldn't let it happen. Well, what we need right now is a bunch of Teflon Christians when it comes to indoctrination. This stuff can get thrown at us, but it's not going to stick. It's just going to slide off us. I don't know about you, but there's nothing like a new Teflon-coated pan to cook an egg in. It just slides right out of there. No oil needed. Yay, right? That needs to be us. Nothing gets there. Nothing sticks. It doesn't dirty us up. It just slides right off of us. And in this day and age, when there's so much indoctrinational effort being made, be a Teflon follower of Jesus Christ, okay? Let's go to faith test number three. This is compromise. This is compromise. In verse 5, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be chained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. So the king serving them his best food. Unfortunately, it just is not the food that these Hebrew boys would have eaten. It, most likely, it was offered to idols. Most likely, it was prepared in a way that wasn't clean, according to Hebrew tradition. Now, should you make issues over this? Maybe not. Maybe you should. They did. It was like, to them, the step of compromise, they couldn't take. You will, we will see that here next week uh, as I talk more about on this. But here's what compromise does to us, friends. Listen to this. It often starts with maybe just this one time. And addiction often starts with maybe I'll try just a little. <clears throat> I grew up with an alcoholic father had a lot of relatives that had alcoholism problems. I had alcoholism problems when I was a kid. The statistic is still true. One in seven people who try it will probably become an alcoholic. For six people, you can have a beer, no big deal. The seventh person, you have that beer, it's the beginning of destruction. That's how addictions work. Oftentimes you think, well, I can just do this, no big deal. But for some people, it's a big deal. You've got to figure out is it a big deal for you? Is, is, is this little decision you're going to make something that's going to lead to further compromise and further compromise and, and, and addiction? And then you just can't enter into that. You just can't do that. Oftentimes, compromise is, is something like the young engaged couple who says, well, we'll just sexually engage one time. And then they have a baby. Because you know that that's what happens, right? When you do that kind of thing. Or the married couple that's not doing well and one of them decides to be unfaithful just the one time. But that's it for the marriage because the trust has been broken and they can never recover from it. That's how compromise works. It's just the thinking is, I'll just do this one time. And these boys were faced with that kind of situation here when it came to the Babylonians. They could, I mean, they're... They're hundreds of miles away from the home. They're, they're here, and they're all by themselves. They're going to be presented with this food that probably is tasty. They could have thought, I can just compromise this one time. What does it matter? Nobody will see me anyway. It doesn't matter at all. But that would have led to probably a road of destruction. But honestly, who would have ever have known? Chuck Swindoll, pastor and author, wrote these words. Character is the moral, ethical, and spiritual undergirding in the life of a believer that rests on truth. 
it then reinforces the right life in a stressful situation and resists all temptations to compromise. And I think what God is calling us to is to be people of godly character. Where when we get into situations of stress, we're resting on who we are in Christ. But compromise begins with, oh, just a little taste of this, just a little that. What can it hurt? Well, it can hurt a lot. So we must be careful that our faith is not destroyed by compromise. And here's what I've seen now. I've been passing a long time now. And uh, it feels like frequently what I see Christ followers do is compromise on something that's so little. And I think, why are you doing that? This isn't even a big deal. Why compromise over it? It's not the big things that get us oftentimes. It's the little things that get us. And I'm not understanding that. And I want to encourage you, friends in Christ, ask God to create in you a heart that just beats after him, the heart that won't compromise, that you'll follow him with devotion and love and sincerity of faith, and, and that you're not going to compromise, especially on little things, especially when no one's looking. You are who you really are when no one's looking. And in those moments, my prayer is stand fast, trust Christ, live for him. Let's go to test number four. Faith test number four is confusion. So Nebuchadnezzar knows what he's doing here. He knows what he's doing. He's trying to strip these young men of their faith and religion um, in order to get to their hearts. And he is uh, aiming at the deepest level in them uh, of their being. So he renames them. Because he wants them to be reminded every time that someone calls out their name that they no longer serve the God of Israel. They now serve the gods of the Babylonians. Previously, all their names reflected some kind of meaning in Yahweh, the God of Israel, our God. Okay? Um, Daniel means God is judge. Hananiah means my Lord is gracious. Mishael means who's like God. And Azariah means my God is my helper. So every time you would say their name, every time you say, hey, Azariah, yes, he would be say, he'd say, you'd be saying, my God, my helper, hey, you know, you'd be saying, you'd be declaring this truth in Yahweh. Well, so what do they do? They rename these men, these boys. And they, their Chaldean names represent God from the Babylonian pantheon. Um, Daniel's now Belshazzar, which means my God, Bel, will supply, will protect all right? Now Hananiah becomes Shadrach, means I'm inspired by the, by the Babylonian god Aku. And now I got Mishael, his name is Meshach, meaning I belong to Aku. And then Azariah is renamed Abednego, meaning I'm a servant of Nego, the, the god uh, of the Babylonians. You see what's going on here? So every time they were now called, it was like, we're trying to brainwash you. We're trying to confuse you. We're trying to take you away from your moorings and, and your footings and your Israel faith. And we're trying to recreate you to be Chaldeans, people of the Babylonian culture. Now, here's, I got to thinking about this. We live in a confusing culture right now. And I see a lot of Christians get really confused at what to do. You know why? I think, and I'm not trying to oversimplify this, but I think there's a lot of confusion today because we simply do not know God's word. And we haven't really grappled with it. And it hasn't become something that's deeply rooted in our souls. And we haven't worked it out. We haven't been working out our faith with trembling and fear. And we don't have, a, we don't have this really, what I call a working knowledge of the word of God. We haven't dealt with the theology of it. We haven't dealt with the practicality of it. We haven't really dunk into the nuances of it. And so we can easily get confused by, by well-meaning sayings that are pithy, but they're not Christian. And it can confuse us really quickly. And we have to be people of the word. People who know what God means and understand his ways. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. God's way illuminates. There's a simplicity to it. Good, we have it. First hour, we didn't have that on the screen. I said, to read it out loud with me, and everybody just stared at me like deer in a headlight. And uh, I said it alone. So would you read this out loud with me and declare it as a, as a, as a word of faith here this morning? Here we go. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Years ago, I was a young guy in my 20s, 
And I can't remember what, what the occasion was, but I was, I was staying at my brother's house for the night. He lives north of the Twin Cities, and I think I was traveling through there. And so he said, why don't you just stay in my camper? He has this big, oh, humongous camper. And he put me in this camper. And, um, and I don't know if you know anything about Minnesota, but he, his house is in the woods. And the woods uh, in Minnesota are dark. You don't see anything in the middle of the night. So I get up in the middle of the night, and I have to go to the bathroom. And I don't know in the word of world is the light switch in the camper. And I thought, well, I know where the door is. I'll just go to the house. He said, he'd leave the door unlocked and I'll go to the bathroom in the house, right? So the camper is about this high off the ground. About this platform height off the ground, all right? For some unknown reason to me, I still don't know it to today. He put the stairs away. I'm not sure why he did that, honestly. And I was exhausted. I remember driving to the house, kind of crawling in bed, just going to bed. So I'm sitting there, and it's dark. I open the camper door. I'm thinking, like I walked in on a step, there's going to be a step when I step down, right? So I take the step. There's no step. And I'm, you know, I don't know about you. I don't, I don't wake up very well in the middle of the night. Anybody with me on that? Vicky. I don't know, she's, maybe that's a wife thing. Maybe it's a mom thing. She can wake up in the middle of the night, fully alert. I remember one time our house had a big water leak going on and it was like raining in the basement and there was all kinds of water and, and the, Liz comes in and tells us in the middle, middle of the night that the house is leaking everywhere. Vicky was out of bed. She was taking action. She said, Steve, get up. I'm going, where am I? I, roll, I literally rolled on the side of the bed. I'm on my hands and the knees. I'm going, is this a dream? Is this real? I can't, I can't, I don't, I don't wake up. Anybody with me like that? It's like I'm on drugs. I'm on a drug of sleep. I just can't get myself out of the slumber. Well, that's what was going on. That camp. I fell on my face, six feet like away from the camper. I'm laying there on the ground thinking, I'm really tired. You ever, man, my elbow hurts. I remember thinking, wow, I feel like I broke my elbow. Where were the steps? You know what I mean? I'm laying there, kind of rolling around on the ground. It must have been comical if you could see it. So I get up, I stumble in, use the bathroom. I crawl back into the camper because I still didn't know where the steps were at. And so, and I crawl in the bed and I remember thinking, man, my elbow hurts, right? So I wake up in the morning <laughs> and the bed is just bloody. Uh, I had just sliced it, big slice right here. Um, probably could have had a few stitches, but at that point, it was coagulated pretty well. And uh, there was blood all over his bed. And I thought, I'm sorry, I bled all over your bed last night. <laughs> you know, so in your camper, what do you do? At that point, I left really quickly, to be honest with you. So, uh, 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 but I was thinking about this falling down thing and how, in the dark, you can get tripped up or you're not paying attention. Some of you might remember this. This platform never used to be like this. It ended back here with a little wooden thing. Remember that little wooden dealy bobber you had here? Anybody remember that? You don't, do you? Well, that, that, that means we can do whatever we want. You never notice anyway. So, so this little wooden thing, it had a, it had a nose piece that stuck, over, stuck out about an inch. It's really good for catching your shoe on. So I'm doing communion. Do you remember this now, some of you? I'm doing communion, and it was right here. And I went to step up on the platform like this, and I caught my foot on that nose thing. And I'm thinking, I'm going down. <laughs> and I have a hold of the communion tray, right? So you know, like any good pastor, I'm going to give my life for that communion tray. <laughs> so I'm holding this thing. It wasn't, it wasn't these buggers. It was, it was the ones that are all wide open. So I'm trying to, as I fall, I'm trying to hold the communion tray up. But you know what happens? Thwack like that. And everything goes shh, shh, like that. And there's just, it's a mess. And I remember laying there thinking, now what? It was kind of dark. I couldn't see where I was going real well. I mean, and I laid there and I thought, don't start laughing because I was going to start laughing because it was hilarious. And I know, you know, this is a secret moment. We're trying to do the thing called communion here. It's a sacrament. And finally, I jump up. I'm okay. And everybody looked at me like, what are you doing? I, well, I don't know why I face planted. I just tripped. There's a lot of times when we just, we trip up in, light when, in life when we don't have enough light. I, I, and, and, and don't really watch what we're doing. I don't know about you. I have a problem falling down. Have you figured that out? 
Because Vicky and I talked, well, I joked about it in a message a while back that I, I don't tell the doctor I fall down anymore because I fall down all the time. It's so it doesn't mean, in fact, this last time she asked me, have you fallen down? And I just looked at her and she said, you have accidentally, haven't you? I said, yeah. She said, but did you do it because you had a medical issue? No, i just clumsy, I think. I don't know what the problem is here. I mean, I remember running in front of Midwest Glass a few years back in the sidewalk, a differential about an inch there. I caught that thing with my toe. There's a recurring theme here. Down I went on my face in front of, in front of Midwest Glass. I'm laying there sprawled out in the sidewalk saying, that hurt. You know, so, so you know what my solution was? I quit running. <laughs> yeah, that's still their lump there. It's still there. They haven't fixed it. But, yeah, at any rate, God's word keeps us from spiritually tripping up. It illuminates the way we should go. It takes away confusion. And I know this sounds almost simplified to say it. Much of our confusion in life goes away if we simply know God's word. If we're really grappling with it and really believing it, it just takes that confusion away, it takes that tripping up away. What are the four faith tests that the Hebrews face that we still face when something ends and something new begins? Isolation, indoctrination, compromise, and confusion. And we still face those same issues today. Now, what I realize is that as disruptive as all this must have been in the lives of Daniel and friends, hurtful and harmful as it was to have their nation come to an end, because that was a reality that's tough. Their nation's been defeated. Um, and, and this new thing is being birthed in them. What, what I think we need to understand is this, that God... God works in the disruptions of life. So here's our big thought. We're going to end with it today. When life is disrupted, a new level of dependence on God can be experienced. And that is the key. To have a new level of dependence on God become the outcome of that disruption. And I think, you know what? When I look back at things like the pandemic and stuff, I think we Christians and Christian community, we did miserably. We didn't do well. I think we got about a D minus. We didn't handle the disruption well. We fought with each other. We didn't learn. We didn't understand that God, God maybe is separating us from this world and maybe wants us to be more dependent upon him. We didn't seize that moment. We didn't do that spiritual kind of work we should have been doing. And, and, and you know, what we need to do is in our lives, we need to understand when something comes to an end, when God's doing something, the question needs to be, be what new thing is he starting? How do I depend on him more? You can't succumb to isolation you can't succumb to indoctrination or compromise or confusion. Instead, you have to be more dependent on God than ever. Here's a couple of reflection questions to consider here. Are you at an ending in something in your life? I mean, if you're a college student, there's this natural kind of flow. You end your college career and you begin your working career, sort of, you know, depending on what you're doing. There's this natural kind of like something comes to an end, something new begins. You know, you can see it. It, it's, it doesn't always have to be a crisis. It doesn't always have to be a negative thing. Sometimes it's positive stuff. You may be doing really well at something, but you just feel God's calling you to do something else. Something's coming to an end. Something new is beginning. If you have unrest, that, is, that could be indicative that God's up to something in your life. So what new beginning is God calling you to? Will you seek to know and depend on God more?